This is, this is so exciting. This is the first Palo Alto Film Festival, and we've never had anything like this, and it's great because it's bringing together what we know to be this really great new technology world and combining it with, uh, with the world of, of entertainment and movies. And, um, and so I think Daviani had a real brainstorm here, and I think we are really in for a, a treat. So um, what I thought I'd do, I do have slides. Oh, good. Yeah. But um, what, I, what I thought I'd do is, um, is talk a little bit about the history, the present, and the future of, of media, of movies, TV, music, uh, because they've really gone through a real transformation. Historically, there was, um, let's just go through the, the music industry. Okay, music industry started out with people just sort of, you know, making noise, drumming, and anybody with an earshot could hear it. And then, uh, and then there, and that was sort of the beginning of concerts, and, and, uh, and, and uh, theater was the same sort of way. Anybody with an earshot could watch a, a Greek tragedy. And then what happened was uh, these technologies took over. Uh, the ability for, uh, for somebody, the, the gramophone, the idea that you could take a, um, a piece of material and replicate a sound uh, would, could uh, spread. And then the idea that you could take an image and you could replicate it and then multiple images and then you could have a movie. And some very clever people then took over and built businesses around, around that. They would take talent, musicians, producers, actors, and they would replicate them and spread them out to the world. And, and, and what happened then was they were all replicated and, uh, and then they became a bottleneck to creativity because uh, they chose who the great musicians would be, and they chose who the great actors would be, and they chose who the great producers would be. And, uh, and so, as technology evolved, the artists all still went to the same places. And they went to what turned out to be the six major movie studios and the six major record companies, record labels. And so for about 50 years, the major movie, movie businesses and the major record companies have had end-to-end -end control between the artists and the, um, and the audience. And all of the technologies played into those hands. Broadcasting played into those hands. Um, uh, the, the, the better and better movies going from black and white to color, that played into their hands. Going from mono to stereo, that played into their hands. Artists still had to go that way. And then along came um, the digitization of, of uh, both music and uh, and video. And that, I think, all started with Peter Gocher at DigiDesign. He, he created a drum beat in, in digits. And then it started to spread, and we got to where, um, where these digits could move faster and faster. And then the technologies all improved. All technologies everywhere improved to where we could now transmit those technologies and start sharing files. And that was the beginning of Napster. And when Napster came along, um, it, it really threw the music industry because that end-to-end -end control was no longer there. The artists could go directly to their talent, to, to their audience. And, um, and that, that collapsing created lawsuits, it created all sorts of trouble. And, um, and then Napster went through, are, are we ready? Okay. Um, and then Napster went through uh, trouble as a lot of 
pioneers do, um, as did, here, you guys want to read my email? <laughs> Can you return my email? That would be the best thing. <laughs> um, okay, so how do I get a slideshow? There we go, slideshow. From beginning. Okay. Welcome to the Palo Alto Film Festival. <laughs> okay, so movies, this is what movies used, movie things used to look like. That was, that's a, a camera and the other thing was a projector. Um, this is what the present looks like. Uh, a great Canon uh, video camera. And this is supposed to be an iPad, and so that's one of the present display techniques. And then this is what I imagine the future to be like. Um, you don't see the whole slide, but this is a guy with about four cameras sticking out of his head. And then he ends up with something like a holodeck. So this is what the movie industry used to look like. And we're not getting the whole slide, but this is what the, the music industry used to look like. And now, the movie industry starts to look more like this, where there's streaming. It started with real, uh, real uh, created streaming, and then, uh, and then YouTube uh, took videos from everybody, because these camcorders were everywhere. And then Netflix, uh, figured out that they could deliver movies to the home and, uh, and they did it in a very cheap way and it was a nicer way to watch than to sit in a theater. And then, uh, and then iTunes figured out the pricing and how, uh, how talent should be priced. And then Hulu changed uh, the nature. They went back to the studios and they said, well, we want your content. All of these people want to see your content. It's the best content out there. And, uh, and then, and then uh, what's, what you don't see here are Amazon, where, uh, where Amazon operated somewhat like iTunes, and then HBO, HBO Go. And what HBO Go is, is the studios looking and saying, you know, this distribution that these new technologists have done is not such magic after all. We can do it. Uh, and so they're doing their own distribution. And so distribution is getting commoditized, which, uh, which really does change the nature of things. This is how music was changed. Um, Napster came and, uh, and they were centralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing. And then Nutella came along and they decentralized it because the centralized part was, uh, was deemed illegal. And then uh, Kazaa came with these super nodes that were all over the place and it made for better quality. And then LimeWire, um, what did LimeWire do? Oh, they created a new protocol that made it a little bit uh, better quality. And then iTunes priced it all in 2002. So these were each about a year apart. And then Pandora, um, and a lot of companies like it in about 2003, 2004, um, figured out a system where the, whereby they'd be a radio station and then broadcast, but the broadcasting wasn't uh, through the air, it was over the internet wires. So uh, this, this just shows that camcorders have gone through a, a remarkable uh, change. They didn't change from, say, 1930 on, but then in 1980, uh, they came up with the CCD, and in 1990, the CMOS act, active pixel sensors. And what that did was it put camcorders on Moore's Law. They, it made it so camcorders were going to get doubly good every 18 months. And that has happened uh, pretty much every year, every 18 months since. Um, and so cameras have improved. There was the Betacam in 1982. And, uh, and then in 1991, they, they got the D1 digital format, and um, now, it's, uh, now they've moved to high definition. And so that has transformed everything so that, uh, so that a, a film festival can happen just like that. We can all start a movie, and we can all create a movie, and all we need is one of these camcorders that's pointed at me right now. Um, and 
And so there's been this proliferation of film festivals because the indie is, uh, the, there's a rise in the independent film. And I think um, some, there's some real changes. So this is, oh, you don't get to really see it. But um, this is my daughter's independent movie. Um, okay, guess how much she made her movie for? Full length feature, Al Alfred Hitchcock thriller kind of a movie. Ooh, a little low, but not too low. She made it for $50,000. And it was with professional actors, and they all sort of have a, a, a real vested interest in the success of the movie. And it's playing here at 10 o'clock tonight at the Aquarius Theater. Um, so, so that's my daughter's movie. Um, and each of you can then go out and you can create a movie, and it's, you know, that includes, you know, colorizing, all the editing, all of that. It's just great. Um, and my son also has a short film. He was at UCLA Film School called Take Your Child to Work Day. And that, that plays after, I don't, plays just before something called Help or Here. It's called Here. And that's tomorrow. Uh, I think it plays at 10 and 4 tomorrow. So watch for that. So Moore's Law is, is this is Moore's Law, and it shows that $1,000 of compute power doubles every 18 months. And it's starting to accelerate. It's actually changing to every 14 months or so. And as a result, all of these things are happening easier, cheaper, and faster. And, uh, and it's really transforming. And, and this is pixels per dollar. So, uh, so that's what it actually, Moore's Law looks like. On a log scale, that's how much is changing every year. So the future, okay, that's what the current, the past and the, the present is. The future looks like this. It's, it's independent. Uh, there's commoditized distribution. So, uh, so distribution is going to be very easy. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but if you go to pay-per-view now, you get a choice. It's Amazon, it's Netflix, it's iTunes, it's uh, Hulu, it's whatever. And you just say, well, I want this movie, and then you get to choose which of these distribution channels you want to use. So those are commoditizing. And you notice also a little bit of a commoditization happening when Sony puts the pressure on, uh, on the, uh, it, it's not HBO, it's the, the other one, uh, to, to make sure that, uh, that the Netflix deal gets renegotiated. And so the, the distribution channel gets less and less important as there are more distribution alternatives. Um, so the future is, uh, also, it, it can go on any screen. So the future is you're going to be able to throw it up on your, um, on your iPhone, and then you're going to be able to throw it onto the screen and then put it on your laptop. And it'll be the same thing no matter where it is because that's all going to be out in the cloud. And then it's all going to kind of look like a holodeck. And what's interesting about a holodeck is this changes all sorts of things. You can, um, you can, in effect, have business meetings where you feel like you're there with the other person. You can have education systems where, where the whole learning experience is an immersion of learning. You, you instead of um, trying to theorize that um, gravity works, um, you, can, you can actually watch it happen on the holodeck and you don't have to break the floor or, or uh, ruin the water bottle. So with that, I leave you with anything is possible. The world is wide open. The world is going to change in immeasurable ways. And, uh, and, and you, too, may end up being Lady Gaga. <laughs> so thank you very much. This is great. And I'm so, so sorry you had to wait for me. And uh, I'll make it up to you somehow. Any questions? Okay. Um, so, based on the pictures that you're getting, what do you think are going to be the changes that are coming next? 
So I'm, I'm looking out there and I'm thinking it's all about virtual lives. I think you're going to be able to uh, feel like you're in Africa, feel like you're in Asia, feel like you're somewhere else and have a completely virtual experience. And that virtual experience can include a business arrangement, it can include um, it's not just video conferencing. I think it, it goes into multi-dimensions. It goes into three dimensions or, or more where you actually feel and see and communicate and, uh, and, uh, and do business with or, or uh, whatever with people and you don't have to be in the same uh, real proximity. And that's happening all over. I remember, you know, it was very confusing for me when my son said, uh, I said, well, you know, go out and play with your friends. And he's sitting there looking at his computer and he says, I am. And it's because he's on Facebook and he's sitting there communicating with all his friends. And I thought, gosh, that's, it. that's a whole different concept of what the neighborhood is. He's not going next door to play ball. He's sort of virtually playing ball with his friends. So I, I, I do think that I'm looking for and they are coming to me, many opportunities that create this, um, this virtual world that, is, that parallels the real world. And ultimately, those two lines start to blur. Yeah? Um, are you not afraid that uh, Google, Microsoft, Um, yeah, the question is, am I worried that Google and Facebook and whatever will replace the old studios and they'll decide what we see on the net? I'm not worried about that. Um, and here's why. Because we have something called crowdsourcing. And what's happening out there is that new concepts and new things rise to the top because of likes and because of uh, star ratings and because of uh, comments that you might put in there after you see something, you say, oh, this is no good, or this is great, and, and so do other people. And those things rise to the top inside of YouTube and Google and, and that, all, all of those different distribution channels. And so I actually think that the artist and his fan are, are going to be almost uh, directly connected, and the distribution channel will be uh, very much commodity, and that I believe that the YouTube and the Netflix and whatever are distribution channels now, um, and the crowdsourcing. Now that may be another place to potentially uh, put your bet is into crowdsourcing because that is there is a real rise to the data that uh, and the outcomes that come from that. Yeah. In your, uh Well, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I'm looking at all of those things. I, don't, I think distribution might be done. Uh, so I'm always looking for sort of what's the next big creative move? What's the big jump that's going to take us to a new, new, in a new direction? Because if you're going to start a business and you just have an incremental improvement, Moore's Law will knock you out of the box. Moore's Law will make it so that the, the entrenched businesses, the entrenched, I call them the monopolies, will, they can do incremental change. They just can't do that big, wild change. And so without that big, wild change, you don't get, um, uh, you, you're not going to be able to build a business long enough before the bigger companies just go and they copy you. So we're, we're looking for, and and content is pretty interesting because it's creative and open and you can do some interesting things with it, but content can be a game, it can be a movie, it can be a number of other things. And content has so much competition that as a VC I have to be very careful about the idea of like betting on a movie. I mean, I, I bet on my daughter's movie, but, 
but the idea of betting on a movie or betting on a single game is very difficult to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're, you've already started to see the flip. The question was, um, if there's commoditization of distribution, then how, what about media rights? What about, you know, media rights were built on, on this distribution model, on this broadcast model. And now it's different. It's a different kind of a broadcast. And it may not be a real broadcast. It may be just a cast to the three guys who, the handy cast. <laughs> to the three guys who really want to see it. And so, uh, so I think it will, we will move toward pricing models of pay per drink, pay per see the movie, uh, because, or pay per listen to the song, because the ownership of that, um, I think, is always so sensitive that I think people are much more willing to rent it out on a paper than they are to, uh, to sell it for somebody to use over and over. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the two questions are, one is, do I see virtualization of characters? And one is, uh, does storytelling change in any way, shape, or... Um, well, the virtualization of characters, they're going to get more realistic, but they're going to get wilder. So, because you can change every single pixel, and you can make it look like anything, and you can fool your entire audience into believing that you're living in avatar world. Um, on the uh, on the first part, the uh, what was that? The, oh, the storytelling. Storytelling, I think, uh, is going to go through a transformation the same way it maybe did as you went from radio to TV. Um, radio was a was just a talking the way the way it worked in history that. Radio was just some guy talking into the radio at the beginning, and occasionally they did play music. But then the movie, then the TV came around, and all radio could think of was put, put a guy there, point the camera at him, and let him talk. And so that was the beginning of the talking head. But then, you know, I Love Lucy came around, and people started to realize there's slapstick, and there are all other things you can do. I think. As the transformation to the holodeck happens, I think storytelling will go through the same kind of transformation. We're going to think it's still two-dimensional, and then all of a sudden we're going to realize that you can have, you know, ninjas coming at you from both sides, all four sides, and it's a different kind of experience. Yeah. And I think there will be a new kind of storytelling. I think it'll be fun. Yeah, that, uh, there's an interesting company that does, uh, that puts, uh, that takes all the game consoles out there and, um, and they're all just sitting there and uh, they can speed up by, by parallelizing all of them. You can, you can actually speed up the processing power and then the quality of the holodeck gets better or the quality of whatever it is you're doing. I point toward the holodeck as sort of like, that's where we're headed. But maybe it could be some other thing that I just don't know about. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Isn't that what you were kind of getting at? Yeah. Yeah, yeah cause you can, you can uh, use all of that processing power. Look, my computer's not being used right now, but it could be easily, you know, they could tap in. SETI already does it. You know, they're, they're looking for the extraterrestrial and if I were tapped into the SETI program right now, I could, there could be an alien right now, and we don't even know it, but it would be good. Yeah.
<laughs> well, I already have. Um, it, well, for this particular reality, I don't know. But I bet on Elon Musk twice, three times. And each time it seems to work out. He just kind of goes for something that's way out there, and then it happens. So like the Tesla, it was like, happened. And SpaceX just happened. And he, now he wants to put us all on Mars, and I think that's going to just happen. Um, for this, one entrepreneur, I don't think it's one entrepreneur. It's, it's a bunch of them. That's taking us in this direction. Um, I don't have one offhand. I mean, I, I know Steve Jobs could have probably pulled this off if he hadn't retired. But uh, so we need another one. Guy, it's one of you guys. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The good businesses, the good companies adapt well and they figure out, he asked how disruptive this, this distribution uh, change is going to be to the existing powers that be. I think the best of them, you know, of those six listed, the best of them will figure it out. They'll figure out a good business model that works for them and it won't be suing 12 year old girls. It'll be a new business model that, um, that transforms the, uh, the pricing uh, and somehow takes advantage of the great distribution channels we all now have and also takes advantage of all the great talent that they've already got going. And there is something to the whole celebrity thing. I think they can continue to take advantage of all these celebrities who we you know, they're like our best friends. You know, you go and you watch some TV show and that's, you see him more than you do your best friend or the guy you think's your best friend. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. That's all right. My speech wasn't very well thought, thought through either. Yeah. This is, a, this is a great question. This is, how does the holodeck change education? And does a Stanford University degree matter, or can you get a better education walking into the holodeck? Right? Something like that. Um, I think it's really interesting. In fact, I had this whole holodeck dis discussion with um, the woman who runs the uh, theater, film, and TV program at UCLA. And I said, you know, you guys could be the center of this entire campus because you can create a holodeck that, that brings um, all of this content from all the other disciplines. And, and that holodeck can be a library of learning that people can go into. And I said, well, why don't you just have one assignment for each of your kids to say, say pick a discipline and create some content that'll go into the holodeck around that discipline. I use the physics example, but you could, you could uh, have fantastic voyage. You could create a holodeck molecule and you could fly through it and you could figure out what's really going wrong when you have cancer or AIDS or malaria. I mean, there could be some really interesting breakthroughs if, you, if, if you're immersed in, in, um, in a learning environment. And, and I, I want to take it a little farther because I know K-12 education has just been crushed here in California. And we went from first to 50th and it was like 1% per year that we dropped. Um, and, and I think what is going to ultimately happen, because, it, it, well, there are a lot of reasons for it, but um, what is ultimately going to happen is the best teacher in the world on on uh, long division is going to rise to the top through crowdsourcing 
And that best teacher in the world is going to then um, be on your pad or you'll walk into a holodeck and that teacher will surround you with long division and you will understand it in the fastest, most efficient way possible. And then the teacher will be more of a room monitor or a tutor watching, making sure you're doing your homework, making sure you're kind of going through the steps that you're supposed to be going through. So I actually envision education uh, making a transformation through this. Uh, and is Stanford still going to be great education? You bet. <laughs> but is, uh, but you know, is University of Phoenix going to really rock and roll? Yeah, they are too. Yeah, you can game the system if, it's, if you're clever. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. How do you control that? How do you avoid game, people who can game the system? I think you just, uh, here's, what, here's what happens in, in my world. As soon as somebody games the system, the entrepreneur has to defend. And he, he can change his business so that no one can game the system again. And it goes back and forth like that. Um, in Washington, you know, one guy does something wrong, and then they change the system for everybody else, and so then we have too much regulation. At least that's my opinion. It's fun to think about, isn't it? Anything else? Anybody? Yeah. Do you know any companies that are trying to, like you were talking about, like the multi face of film and where it's going, but like incorporating like different kinds of smells and different kinds of smoke? I mean, we're doing a kind of free mm -hmm. stuff. Well, I know that's, a big, that's the big goal, is to sort of have that virtual world completely exactly what you would be experiencing if you went to a certain place. Um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah, the question here was, um, are, are there entrepreneurs, certain entrepreneurs, that are, are looking at the holodeck and saying, well, look, it, it's only visual and oral and... Uh, and it doesn't include all of the senses. So does it get tactile? Does it get your uh, or olfactorily, whatever? I don't know. These words are very complicated for me. Um, does it hit all the senses? And I think the answer is uh, it's only limited by the imagination of entrepreneurs. And if somebody says, yeah, I'm going to put the... Now, there are certain places where I don't really need the smell. <laughs> but people might do it anyway because it gives you a more realistic feel for what's actually out there. And so, um, and then the tactile thing, you know, I do think that people are getting closer with that. That you can, um, you can do it through electro stimulation, you can do it through uh, uh, manipulating your mind a little bit. Uh, there are ways of of doing that. Oh, that's one other thing. A new technology that's very, very interesting is you put this thing on your head, like a crown thing, and, and you can actually, I've done this, and it's just bizarre. You can move the mouse. You can move the mouse, you can click, you can, you, with, without moving a piece of your body, you just mentally control the mouse, and it is weird. But, uh, but it's doable, and I think that that technology could take off and be something really significant in the future, too. Okay, just time for one more question. Here you go. Do you have education that How about your politics and social thinking? We all would be thinking on the whole society. Would it help in this better government? This is great. Um, <laughs> this could be a much longer answer, but I'm going to make it fairly quick. Um, the question had to do with um, what's going to happen to politics in this kind of environment? What's going to change in politics? Um, I'll tell you one thing that's already changed, and that is geographic borders have fallen. And when geographic borders fall, then you have to think about 
that governments are going to have to compete with one another for the great minds and the capital of the world. And so it becomes a, comp politics becomes a competitive sphere. It becomes yet another competitive sphere because if we're in the holodeck, we don't really care which government we're with. We need to, we want to choose the one that's best for us. If we're on a land mass in real life, we are able to travel a lot easier than we ever were before. And we can choose the government that's right for us. So that means our, all these governments are going to have to compete for us. If you're a bad government, you get overthrown or everybody leaves. And if you're a good government, everybody stays. And that is something that's really interesting that many of the other countries of the world have really recognized. I mean, I've gotten a chance to meet with the heads of many great countries because they have invited me to come talk about venture capital and entrepreneurship there. Now, if I try somehow to get to Washington and talk to somebody there, they'll still push me away. So somehow we don't recognize that we're in cell mode now. And so I think the, our, the US federal government does need to turn and realize we're in cell mode. We want to keep people. And, and I think we need this, you know, we need optimism. It's, it's like, hey, things are great. OK, so there's unemployment. Those people all need to be put to work. That is great for entrepreneurs. And some of those people are going to leave their jobs going, you know, that guy didn't really run that business very well. I can do a better job. And he's going to go start, start a competitive business. And if he's clever, he'll start a competitive business that starts with technology that's five years past where we are today. So with that, thank you all. Have a great time. This is really fun. And I'm so sorry I was late. Thank you.